Okay, nice. Uh, welcome everyone, and welcome to this week's uh, session on deep learning, in which to take you through like introductory pathway and in how you could get started in deep learning. And within the past few weeks, you've done some amazing work so far, and particularly like last week, we covered on computer vision, in which you saw what were problems in 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 terms of vision in which you could use computer vision to solve that building AI systems that focus on images and to apply those AI uh, computer vision systems to solve those problems. And I guess with the assignments, you saw how you could train computer vision models uh, for even no matter how much of the size of the models. So in this particular week, we'll be focusing on two things, but much more towards the first one, which is custom data sets and going modular. So each of them are not super technical. So I believe like the second one is much more about you structuring your code, which is very good. It's more of like software side of things, because when you write code, and definitely someone else would use it, or in most cases, other people would use it. So how would you structure your code in the most appropriate way? So at the end of the session, at least with custom data sets, you will learn how to load data sets that are not perhaps not uh, not readily available on PyTorch. So using raw data sets. And uh, yes, so, um, so I would start. Uh, and this is the like main resource for this particular course, which is by uh, Daniel. So particularly this week, we'll be focusing on custom data sets. Then I will just start on that. Yes. So, so uh, yes. So custom data sets. So custom data set, you could call it like an additional feature or a tool you have in PyTorch. So the way you could think about it, you, in most cases, you have to deal with data in the real world. And data in the real world is mostly messy and it's not like the way you expect it to be. Then with, let's say, custom data sets. So what it helps you to do is how you could easily load this data and perform like any uh, interesting operations you need to perform on, on your data that you have. So primarily, so uh, yeah, so I will just still, I will skip most of the part because you read them, understand them. Then I explain maybe something outside the scope of this or go more in depth in one or two things. So yeah. I think I would. So I think one thing also that is worth noting in, like when you try to do like uh, any machine learning problem or deep learning problem, you should understand like there are various, uh, maybe there are different types of data you'll be encountering. One of which is images. One might be audio. One might be just text data. So one of the good things is with, with PyTorch, you have like different. PyTorch maybe libraries or sub libraries that you could use to focus on one particular domain of data. You have Touch Vision, which is very good for when you deal with image like data. So with image like, I also maybe would say including videos. So you have Touch Audio where you need to use uh, PyTorch for dealing with uh, audio data and you have text and you have recommendations. So these recommendations can be in terms of uh, graphs or any kind of those systems where you have data that has to do with recommendation data. So in most cases, to so maybe text also. And yes, so like we covered, what you usually do in deep learning or machine learning, you have a data set, you build a model, and your model does a particular kind of prediction. And to know how your model does, you have to have some metrics in which you gauge like the performance of your model. So briefly, I will skip over this and maybe go to the more important parts. Then this is very familiar to us. That's where you import your PyTorch and make try as much as possible for your code to be device agnostic in which it could run in CPU or GPU. So let me just turn on my GPU one minute. So... So 
So, uh, like we said, in PyTorch, what you have, you already have like a data set library, which has pre-existing data sets. And easily in the last exercise, you saw how you use uh, Fashion MNIST and you could easily load Fashion MNIST from using PyTorch data set. It downloads it and you could easily pass it into data loader. But in the real world, that's not the case. Like I said initially, like data is usually very messy. So you have to formulate ways that you could load those data sets. So what you have usually, so in the very first case here, the approach is to download your data that you have. So here it's in a zip file. So here, your data here is in a zip file and you unzip it just using this segment of the code. Then more of like the downloading happens. Yeah, the downloading happens here. You download and here you unzip. So this is a Python library to perform zipping and unzipping operations. So this part lib here is a Python library in which for maybe manipulation of parts. So it's, it kind of helps you to create or manipulate parts easily. So if you haven't used it, I would advise to uh, check out this part lib. It's really nice. So especially where you have to do, let's say you, let's say for me, I use Linux and let's say you use Windows and someone uses Mac. So they have kind of different uh, way you specify your parts, but with this part lib, so it's easy to specify parts in one particular area and you don't need to worry about if someone is using a Mac or uh, Windows. So it's, it's really good. So you could try it out also. Yes. So let's say you have downloaded your data and yes. So next it's more of data preparation and you could see the structure of your data here. So you have, this was a zip file you downloaded and this is, let's say the unzipped file and you could see it's already arranged, train and test here already. And you could see in each of the Screen or test, you could see there are like three categories of data which corresponds to your labels or your targets. So here, a good way here is to run this code to just see what is like the content or what, how many data occurs in each of these subdirectories. Then you could see in pizza, like under your train data, under pizza, you have 78 images. Under sushi of your train data, you have 72 images. So, and you could see in your test data, you have like 25 images for pizza and like so on. So here your train data is more, you have about 75, then in your test data, you have about 25 data points each, which is good. But I think the next step for you now is, maybe you could visualize, just have a feel of the data, but more primarily, I think our focus is towards how you could, load your data. So in loading the data sets, you remember what we said with data, particularly images, in most cases, you need to perform some transformation. And why is transformation important? So transformation is important in many ways. One is data augmentation. So in most cases, you would be, so you have a data set, so your assumption is your data set might be, you want it to be, or the dream is you want your data set to be representative of maybe the problem you want to solve. But in most cases, that's not the case because you have very few data sets and the challenge is it might not generalize well to the problem. So what you want to do is to augment your data and how could you perform the augmentation? One way is to use transforms here. So in which, as the name basically go, you transform your data in one particular manner or the other, but you see, some examples of what this, uh, how, some examples of the transforms you can apply to images. So here it's more of emphasizing like you have vision, when you have vision problem space, you could apply, let's say, you could get the data sets or some data set tools from vision.data, same for audio, text, and recommendation systems. So I think primarily here, we would look more on the transformations. So yes, yeah, so maybe just to give, a more concrete feel about it. So imagine you are dealing with still images and let's see, 
I have this kind of box here, which is like pixels of my images. And for me, uh, please can we kindly mute the mic just so that others could hear? So let's say you have, yes. So let's say you have, I have like an image where, well, yes, so I have an image. So I would say maybe uh, this image one, image one was by, let's see, maybe Abdullahi. And this image two is something drawn by maybe Al Amin. So I tell them to draw the number or to write the number two. So Abdullahi can decide to write the number two here. And Al Amin could decide to run to write his number two, maybe somewhere in the middle here. But you could see like this, two images in the real world, there are two different images. But in the sense that when you have your data sets, so your data set can likely just comprise of one data. But you want to make it in some way, it should be representative of different ways people can write to. Because people can write to, apart, this is like just considering position, which is one of the factors. And maybe someone could write his two in a different way. So maybe it looks something like a Z. So you could see you need to account for that. So uh, let's say that's position and maybe structure, then maybe in terms of the strokes. So once some could be darker than the other, some lighter than the other. So with transforms, it helps you kind of take care of all these intricacies in which you will have. So I would just highlight some few points on some, there are lots of transforms you could do, but I'll just talk about the very popular ones. Oh. Hey, one minute. Sorry, my screen froze. So I'll just talk about the very popular one, one of which is the resize transform here. So what does this resize transform mean? It just means like resize any image I have. So why is this important? Imagine like your neural network and you always know like your neural network has some form of structure. So it has some form of structure is accept. So here you could see, maybe we could just say it has, for simplicity, you could say it has five input neurons. So what always your neural network accepts here, it's like five inputs coming in. But here's just very simple. You are looking at like a simple, maybe fit for neural network, not convolutions. Then let's say you are considering images. You could say maybe your neural network is considering maybe 256 by 256, maybe set of images. But we know that's not the case. Like think when you think about it in the terms of maybe hardware or anything. So maybe the image from my camera might be not by this size, a very rectangular size. Someone, you have different sizes of images. Then what you want to do is to align like those different sizes of images into what your uh, model accepts here in the input. So that's why resize here is very important. So you want to resize to just fit your input that you have. So one other consideration you say resize might be important is when you are, yes, yeah, so like for us humans, you could say maybe the bigger the size, the better, maybe the more clearer it is, you want it in HD or something of that nature. But looking at like in computer vision problem, it's great loss of complexity because when you have very high dimensional data, you need very high compute. So if you could get a solution with very low dimensional data, let's say you have, data set of maybe 64 by 64 and it gives you reasonable uh performance so why not go for that so you don't need higher accuracy so that's it for uh that's it for let's say resize and i believe like same goes for random horizontal flip so because similarly like you could find uh maybe you are dealing with images of perhaps okay so let's see you are dealing with images perhaps in a while let's see a zebra looking 
towards the left or right or looking towards the right in the first case and and you train your model on that then imagine your model encounters another zebra looking towards the left so you see there are like some kind of there is some this kind of disparity except if your model is really intelligent enough to understand it's a zebra so it kind of creates some issues sometimes so you perform this is a random flip horizontal so it performs like some kind of flipping on like the horizontal axis so that's one way you could also do a random flip vertical so that's there are like several transforms so one other transform you could look at is uh, rotation so but uh, i don't think there's rotation in the notebook but let's say we might come into it so you might want to rotate your data in some particular angle it can be a random angle or you could specify the angle so when you look at the rotation too it's like kind of pretty uh good because like some people might decide let's say you want to take a picture you are not 100 percent certain you take the pictures at right angle so where it's perfectly aligned some might just for fun just take pictures so it's like in the wild like pictures are uh taken in there are like various it kind of helps in training when you have uh when you put in some random angles or when you augment your data using random angles. Like I said, like there are several augmentation uh, transformations you could do to augment your data. Then finally, what you would want to... We can mute our mic. Mute our mic. Uh, yes. So one more thing is uh, finally, like after you've performed this transformation, so you want at the end of your day, your data to be an a tensor values because when you perform this manipulation, it's likely these manipulations are performed on NumPy arrays and what's returned to you is a NumPy array. But you understand like from the very beginning, we spoke about how tensors is important. That's like the main language of manipulating like your data. So it's better, to, it's always good to keep everything uniform. Then that's where you have this transform dot tensor. So what it basically does is transform any data set into, uh, or any data into a tensor. So into a PyTorch tensor, yes. So, uh, yes, so just to, so you remember, yeah, just like we said, like you have various type of transform and let's say you want to apply those transform to a set of images or data sets that you have. So you want to combine everything. So there's one neat way of doing it. They call it uh, transform compose here. So it's a PyTorch, it's a transforms, uh, uh, it's a kind of a class for like combining all the transform. So look at it in, let's say you have your images here. So your images will kind of go into a set of transforms. So this can be maybe transform one, transform two, that have some different transformation operations. Then your images just go through this set of transformation. And at the end of the day, you have another maybe different looking image. So that's the output of the transformation. So everything here, you could just put everything here into like a compose operation. So it just like it aggregates all the compose and pass your images all through everything. So that's what the compose basically does here. So remember this transform, you could, or all this transform, you pass them in your data loader. So also remember your data loader, it defines how your data is loaded from like your disk to memory or RAM or your GPU for training your machine learning system. So I think that's it for transform, but please feel free to ask any question in the chat. And if you want to make any contribution, please feel free and uh, yes. So I will skip some parts because like most of the parts, we already know them, or I believe when you read them, you could easily uh, understand them. So here, just to give you an a highlight of how transform works. Okay. So you could see this is the original pizza, or let's start from here. You have, yes, you have pizza, but you could see here it's transformed in some way. And you can look at what transformation happened to this image. <clears throat> so one of the transformation, you resize it to 64 by 64. 
So you could see it becomes very much pixelated. So what I mean by pixelated, it's like in blocks, you could see kind of some block representation. So for you, it might feel like a bit bloody or it doesn't make sense, but maybe the computer does what it wants. Maybe it learns better here. So for you, maybe this is better. So, but maybe it's much more efficient in training uh, computer vision systems with like lower pixel images. And one other operation here is like horizontal flip. So let's look at this image as if there was any horizontal flip. So I think you ha have something like this. Let me see. Yes. So here you could see like the image was flipped in some way. You could see this kind of trim along the plate. You could see it's no longer here. It's on the other side of the plate. So that's where like your horizontal flip comes into play. And yeah, let me check. the. Last. So the last one is just to set tensor, PyTorch tensor. So which, uh, yeah, so it just like converts the images into PyTorch tensor. So here too, you could vividly see the flip. You could see this, I don't know, red, I don't know, jelly, but you could see it's not low, it's no longer at this side of the images, at the other side of the image. So the image too is pixelated. That means we have reduced the size of the image just so that it's kind of efficient for training like we discussed and easier for your system to train on like low dimensional images. But you, it's always a trade-off. So yeah. So I think primarily in this particular uh, session, how could you load your data set, uh, your custom uh, data using custom data sets? So there is an already existing, uh, what's the name, module or let's say class you could use, which is image folder. So primarily what image folder does is you pass in a part of a folder that I already have. So that part of the folder has some data sets in it. But be mindful, your data set or the part had to be like in a very clean way. So what do I mean by in a clean way? So you have to represent it in this manner. So you could see here, you have an initial structure and that structure, you have like your test here and you have your train here. And under your train, directory you have like subdirectories here and this is another subdirectories under your train so you could see like they're all in a very like neat manner so everything's arranged in order so what it does is just traverses this and it knows like these are like the classes of the images and it looks under those classes for those images so that's one thing you could use image folder here to just load your data set from your image so but you need to make sure like your data is or the arrangement is like in a very good manner in this particular uh, case so in the high level you have like the overall structure is it a train data or test data or a validation data then each under each of the subdirectories of test or train so you have like classes arrange uh, data arranged by their classes so it's it's easy when you have like your data well let's say cleaned out or well structured so in terms of like the folder wise and but it becomes a disadvantage if like you don't have this folder wise arrangement or your data is not it's not direct in some way but we'll look at one other different way to go about it so why how could we do this? So you could do it by, yeah, you could do it by importing like data sets from like the touch vision library. So it provides you with like a class here for loading the images. So what you do here, you provide like the, uh, the part for the train data, which is like this part. And you could also, let me just, So you could see like the part of the data here, you have data, which is this high level. So you have uh, pizza's uh, steak sushi, which is this, and under it you have train data. So what you do is pass this part here to like the image folder, and it takes that, uh, that part and traverses into it. So what also happens, what does it take? It takes, it takes the data transform you pass into it, which is this. Yeah, this kind of transformation. So you want it to apply this transformation on your data. So 
also you have like target transform like we said the target transform is how you manipulate your uh target or your label uh your label data let's say you have it it's uh let's say your target is maybe ones or zeros and you don't want that you want it to be or let's say your did your target is maybe on or off and you don't want it to be like a string you could use this target transform to convert it into numbers or anything so same also similarly you do the same thing for your test data so yeah then here you have like essentially from your data sets so you have like your train data you and you have your test data and if you want to do more you could do something different for validation uh data so but in this case we are just considering train and test data and yeah so here is much more of like an additional information that comes with the uh, image folder uh, class so you just have some additional information which you could use to your advantage you could see what's happening it's the standard transform and it's composed of several other transform so it also tells you like the data points under the train so it sums up everything so it tells you it's two five and here in the data set for test, it tells you it has 75 data points and you could use any of that to your advantage. And you can also see like the flipping by default is 0 0.5. That it has like, it uses a uh, 50% chance. You know, when you flip a coin, so you have like 50% uh, chance it's either a head or a tail. So it's telling you when it is looking at every data. So there is equal chance that it's either, it will flip it or not flip it. So that's what uh, the percentage means here. So I think I will just breeze over this and so, but please feel free to draw me back if there's anything you don't understand. So yeah. And uh, yes. So uh so here's just more information of the data. So here you already have your uh let's see your data set that you have kind of uh, defined. So here's just more of like just checking what's the composition of your data sets. Then here you might just want to visualize the data sets. Then this uh, permute here. So, okay. So I will just maybe give small, uh, so remember when you are dealing with uh, image data set in PyTorch, so what you had is in in PyTorch. Now please, can we kindly mute our mic, please? So what you have basically is maybe channel height width, but the issue, like remember what we said, like when you are dealing with NumPy or or you want to plot images with what's the name? Uh, you want to plot images with let's say Matplotlib, for instance. So Matplotlib uses uses this height width channel. So if you want to plot with Matplotlib, you want to kind of change the orientation of like the images or tensors or arrays that you have from PyTorch. So that's where this permute comes in. So permute basically means like changing the order of things. So what you are saying in permute here is like take the, so. So what you are seeing here is like so permit, what you want is like take the first index and uh okay, maybe take the second index, which is this, and make it uh put it in the first uh the first index. So what it does, it takes H. So it's just telling it like how you want it to arrange your data. Like take the first index. Remember, this is zero, one, two. So what you want first is your one. So it takes one as H. Then you want your two, that's W. Then finally you want at index zero to be last. That's remember index zero is here C. Then it performs the transformation. So that's uh, permute. Then you have this fine image of like, or not really fine, of pizza here. So, yeah, that's at least can we use our right? So, um, yeah, so I think that's, so moving, yeah. 
So I think the next part is where you have data loaders and we've explained what data loaders is. It's just to define how your data is loaded into memory. Then what you pass into your data loader is your data sets in which you have successfully, uh, you successfully have as a data set. Yeah. And there you define the right. The right set is like how many sets of all this? Is it Sani, please can you mute your mic? Please. And I'm not sure who, whose mic is open, but please, if we can mute our mics, please. Mm. So, and so one other thing you would consider is number of workers. So think of number of workers in how many kind of, so you have this large data sets and in like computers, you have what you call like maybe processes or processes. So in maybe when you look at maybe a laptop, you could say maybe your laptop, it has maybe eight cores or some kind of number of cores. So you could run, so each processes runs a particular kind of executes a particular program. So here, what you want is you have several process to kind of load your data set instead of just one process, like picking out your data. So it becomes kind of intensive for just one process like just picking the data in most cases, if you have very large data sets. But if you have like very, a very big compute or very big memory, so you could suggest like having several processes that are picking the data in parallel. So it's reasonably kind of fast because they are working in parallel. So that's what you consider. That if you have enough maybe compute, then you would suggest changing this number of processes into maybe as much as processes as you have but it comes with some kind of issues if you kind of put in more processes than you have available so it slows down your some processes that you have so it becomes slower than expected yeah so that's it so i think this is we've mostly touched on this so i will just uh yes yeah so i'll just uh ignore it so please, if you have any questions, you could kindly uh, send in the chat. So the next kind of way you could do it, remember I said, like, if your data set is not well-structured, like how you have it initially, then you define, you use custom data sets to define how your, it, how you would load your data from like anywhere it's stored. So that's where like custom data sets come into play. The custom data set gives you the flexibility of how you want to load your data. And uh, yes, so here outlines like how, what's the pros or cons of data sets. So easily you could, let's say load any data. And so here it says, it doesn't mean it will work, which might not be the right way, but let's say if you do it in the right way, it will definitely work out for you. But I think one challenge you might face when using custom data, you might not utilize like all the necessary available memory so it can become slower because you are doing it yourself and you might not be an expert in maybe designing let's say you are dealing with very large scale systems so you could do it in a very naive way and not optimize like the compute resources that you have so but it will definitely work if you know what you are uh, doing shall so here's just to look at how you could create the custom data. So I would just overlook this. Here you are basically doing some uh, importations and let's see. So, so I'll just overlook this. So it's something you could look at and maybe discuss more on the more important part of the, yes. So what you have here is, so what you have here is like a snippet of the code which is like a custom data loader. Uh, just to take you back, remember we said like there are data sets existing in let's say vision.dataset, like the fashion MNIST you use. So easily it's already prepared for you. So what you do is just call them, it automatically downloads and you kind of put it into your data loader and you could use it readily. But in most, uh, most cases in real world, you have to like define how your your code loads that data. So, which is one of these ways you could do. So, yeah, what you have is one minute. So, here, what you have is like 
this touch utils and data sets. So this is like a data set object. So what you are doing here is more of like subclassing from that data set object. So you are telling, hey, look, I know you have a data set, but I want to do something much more cooler with it. So which will benefit me more. So yeah, so that's what you are basically doing. So in the init, like we said, in the init is just more of like uh, attributes, which is like the data you, so like general concepts of classes, like your attributes are like data that are stored in the class and you have like some methods here, which perform some function for you. So, so it could be kind of basically anything. So you are free to define what you want or the manipulations you want, but there are some basic things in which you definitely would have to, uh, you definitely will have to do, which is like the magic functions here in length and get, uh, what's the name, get item. So those are like very fundamental to the custom data sets because when you pass the data set into your, uh, AI system, so it uses those particular functions to operate. Yes. So, so when you look at this, so what this is first doing here, so it's like defining a list of parts. So these parts are all the parts of your of your data. So what it uses, remember we said like partlib, it's really good for manipulating uh what's the name for manipulating parts where you have like string parts but it's like operatable within any operating system. So what you are doing, you are searching like a list of parts and you are doing a kind of this globe in here, you are passing it some, let's say some regex operation. So it could be pure string or regex uh, maybe character. So this globe in here is searching like within your string, does something similar to this expression exist? So what is this expression? This expression is telling it that, one minute. So this expression is telling it that I'm expecting, uh, so I'm expecting like an image or any string ending with .jpg at the very end. But before, before the string, I have this asterisk. So this asterisk is what they call a wildcard. It could be anything. So, so it's the aesthetic, so it could be anything. So you're expecting maybe any character. It could be maybe just hello slash with a kind of directory part with like anything dot JPG. So it makes that set for you within that uh, maybe list of list of parts. So that's what it is doing. Then you have like, you have your transform here, which accepts. Yes, you have your transform here, which is like the transform we talked about, in which you saw there are different you could you could create using like the transform dot compose, and here you could have like the classes here that is passed into uh what's the name that's passed into that's passed into uh like as an attribute here. So what does this mean? So remember when you have a data set, you could maybe just call, the, let's say you call an MNIST data set, you could call maybe the train data set dot class. So maybe you could say it's something similar here. So when you have, or not so much, yeah. Yes, maybe not so much, sorry, I'm confusing things. So, so what you do here is, in this particular method, you just load your images. So this particular uh, method here, or this particular part of the code is from your pill library. So pill library is a library for manipulating or uh, using images. So for performing some operations in images. Then when you open an image part here, so it opens the actual object of the image and you have some form of data in that image then you could utilize that data for what you need. But this is just like, this is just like a helper function. So, but it doesn't need to be that way. It could be anything you want it to be. So just one minute. So I think the more important part here is length here and get, get uh, item here. 
So because when you are using uh, this data set, so, and you pass it to a data loader, your data loader makes use of this. So length here is to get what is the size of your data set. So, because when you pass into your data loader and it, you pass in batches into your data loader, it needs to like subdivide your data into some parts into like sizable amounts based on your batch size. So it needs this length here to divide it. So that's why it's very necessary to divide this, uh, to define this length uh, magic function here in, in your custom data set so that your data loader could make use of it. Then finally, it's your, it's your get, get item uh, method here. So get item here, it's like telling you to return an item. So it's also like a kind of magic function for data sets. So here it's just more of like pick an item and return it. So because your data loader also make use of it. If you look at the code itself, so what you do is here you call like the internal, you call like the internal uh, method you have, which is this here and you kind of open, you load an image. So you look at an index and you load an image, you load in an image, then this gets like the part for you. So here you just get the class name. So you utilize like the part of the image to get the class name here. But I wouldn't advise maybe going this direction because this is a simple example, so it works. But when you are dealing with some maybe some crazy data with an image maybe named let's say you have an image 098.1.jpg so here you could not be able to tell like the class name just by knowing the image or it has some like crazy uh maybe class name here let's see my pictures so you have to find some maybe other intelligent ways of doing it. so i'm just saying this because in general you might face some challenges then you have to know how to uh play around this yes so yeah so and i believe after like getting your image you apply your transform to the image and finally you return like the image and the maybe class index so this is what like your data loader will expect when you pass this data set object into your data loader so it's very good to maybe understand this, especially if you want to create your own uh, custom data sets. So these are like the two most important parts. So there are other magic functions so you could use. So, but these are like the two primary ones. If you take care of this, you are good to go. So, but just make sure anything you need, you set it out in the very beginning. So, yes, but I could kind of go over, I would be glad to go over this if you don't get it. So, but if there are anything, I'll be happy to talk. Yeah. yeah. So, and let's see here, you have your custom data set. So what you could do is pass your custom data set into your, uh, so here you have your custom data sets and you could pass in your transforms here and it which transforms the data. So, here you have some yes. yeah yeah so i would say yeah so i would say like the challenge here is when you imagine the initial workflow here you have that we had you had a data set and you have a data loader so what the data set does is like, you have like some actual kind of data representing your data set, be it images or text. Then you have your data loader, which defines how you load your data into training. But here it's more of like taking a different approach. So here you have your data set object and you are performing, you are passing your transforms into your uh, data set here. But if you remember in the previous approaches, your transforms only go into, mostly go into your data loader because that's like the convention. So here might, maybe I'll just say it's maybe a wrong approach to returns. We don't in, need to pass in your, uh, what is the name? Uh, 
transforms to your data set directly. So you could just define the data set as it is, then it should return like the image and the class object. But this transforms should definitely go into your data loader, which is like you start from data set, then data loader, then you maybe train or test. So maybe that's the convention, but I might be wrong. So, but let's uh, let's see how things go. But I think that's like the basic explanation of like how custom data sets work in general. You have like this magic function length and uh, what's the name and get get item here. Yeah. So, so to just go quickly, so here are just some uh functions in which we might not need to go into so so in case maybe i do uh you need any explanation on any of these things please feel free to draw me back so here it's an additional explanation of transforms in which we just did so like there are various transformations you could make to your image data set just so augmentation increases the size of your data so when you augment a data, let's say you kind of perform some rotation or some flipping or any operation, or you darken the image or transfer some parts. So one other operations or transformation you could look at is like gray, gray scaling the image. If you remember like the initial example we did for fashion image, it was in gray scale, and maybe you achieve some reasonable results. So you could definitely try to gray scale like three channel images, like from three channel colored images to black and white. So you could definitely try that and there's a transform that for that. So feel free to utilize any transform. And the transforms like definitely like coming to advantage for you. It like you said, it helps you generalize well. But the way you select your transforms also matters because when you look at it, let's say you have a data set and you want to apply transforms to it. So what you usually do is like to use your own bias to select the, uh, the transforms. So in some ways it would work or in some ways it might not work. So there are like a number of additional techniques in which also apply transformation, but in a different way. One of which is this uh, transform augment and trivial augment. So random augment is like you pass in a set of different transformations, then it picked the transformation at random. So you don't need to set an other structure of transformation. Maybe you say, uh, maybe rotate, crop, or something of that nature, but it kind of selects it at some kind of random, at random sense. So you have this trivial augment, which is almost similar to uh, random. So you kind of, I believe you kind of pass in like a kind of degree of, intensity of how it should uh, perform the transformation. Let's say you are considering some rotation, then you kind of give it a boundary. Let's say you rotate between zero and 30 degrees. Then maybe at random, it naively kind of selects like how the degree of rotation would be or how, like to what direction it will flip it. So there are various approaches you could use just to highlight uh, some very few. So. I think I would just quickly just jump into a different part. The issue is, or why I want to do that is just so that we could move at a very good pace and it's something you could like go through yourself. So to just ask, uh, yes. So which is going modular? So going modular is more of like the software engineering part of things. So how you could easily yeah. Thank you. So it's more of like how you could easily kind of run, uh, how you could arrange your code, like in a very standard manner as, even though you are a data scientist or a machine learning engineer, at least it should be up to some standards. So that's like using the OOP kind of concepts. So to just briefly uh, ask, so what's the difference between feel free to answer and there's no wrong question. What's the, the difference between, uh, let's say a function and a class, for instance. So when should you use a class or when should you use a, a function? Please, you could just easily type out, or if you want to 
on mute. Feel free, please. Uh, can I say? Yes, please. So a function is like uh, a defined rule that perform a specific action. Yeah. Uh, but uh, class can have uh, many functions within it, and yeah, uh, they may be performing different things. Okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, I think there is one more in the chat. So function one, we have many functions and objects. Yes. So uh yes, there is a response from Fatima first. Object are instances of a class, which is good. And you have when you have many functions attached to an object, you want to use a class, correct? So yes, I think you are all correct, but there is a different way you could look at it. I didn't see how I would run the code, but just to give you an idea where you have. Yes. So when you look at it this way, let's see you have, so when you look at it, you have a function. So like all you said, it's very much correct. So function, you perform kind of some operations. So, but the operations, you kind of just perform an actions. So function, when you look at it, it just performs some operation on some, maybe some data in that particular case, but itself doesn't have like a data stored in it. But when you look at class, you have two things. You have a data and maybe, let's say, a set of one or two operations. So always when you want to define either a function or class for something, so look at it in a particular aspect that you want it to just perform only an operation. So when you want it to just perform an operation and you don't want it to store any data within it, then you use, what's the name? You use like your function itself. But when you want it to store some data and still within it perform some operation or perform, yeah, perform yeah, some operation or actions, then you use the class itself. So that's like one good way, but your answers are like 100% valid. But let's say I just want data alone. I don't want any operations. So what do you think I could use in that particular case? You could just give any answers. Please. So there are also no wrong answers. So just learn, you could type or say anything. So let's say I just want to store data. So what do you think I could use? So I don't want operations. Yes, there is an answer by the command. So hundred percent. So when you just want to store data, I just use any data structure, which could which could be either uh maybe a list or maybe some dictionaries and so on and so forth. So uh, why I just want to say this is because when you start structuring your code, you want to make sure you make these decisions as maybe not soon as possible but you have an idea of why you are making those decisions. So it will make, usually make your code cleaner in some cases. And one thing you should know that if, if you are doing something more than once, so either make it a function or maybe just have a class that does it. So in most cases, like when you are dealing with functions and when you are doing some operations more than once. So one easily operation that you could look at is when calculating accuracy. So you could, calculate accuracy more than once in your notebook or maybe anything. So why not make it to be a function because you are using more than once. So if you have a function, it is much more easier for you than writing it over and over again. Or maybe you might not need to write it over and over again, but it's easier for someone reading your code. Like this person called an accuracy uh, function. What does it do? I look at it once, I understand. But imagine you kind of write it multiple times in your code. I'm always looking at it. Is it the same, like the former one you've written or something different? So that's, uh, yeah. So I think that's where this is the particular focus of this notebook. So how would you arrange your code to be very modular? And when it's modular, you have things like they are, they have like some kind of structure and it's easy for you as a machine learning or deep learning engineer to easily work out the solutions and focus on the more important parts and you could easily adjust like your hyperparameters. So you would see later on in like the course, how you to use weight and biases. If you're not familiar with it, it's totally fine. We would go through it and very likely we'll do 
some session on Kedro. So Kedro is a data science tool for like kind of formalizing or having a very structured project, similar to how you have Conda for managing libraries. So it helps in uh, managing, uh, what's the name, like your projects. So like in the internship I work, I partly worked with the, I worked with Kedro. So I will be happy to maybe discuss more on it just so that it will be very beneficial to you as it has been very beneficial for other people. So I think that's basically it. But please feel free to ask questions. And if you have any, so like this particular week is composed of maybe two lectures. The second one is maybe I believe something you could read on your own self. And please, if you could uh, try to do the two exercises, if it's not too much, but if it's too much, just draw my attention and we'll know what to do about it, inshallah. And uh, yeah, so that's majorly it. So I think, uh, I think with regards to like the the what was the name the assignment to review hopefully inshallah within the weekend or maybe tops by monday and i'll get back to you in particular i think the first thing i'll send you like the peer grading like a match with who will be grading you by either tonight or tomorrow morning inshallah so and i think that's immediately by my side so i'll just wait one minute if there are any questions you want to ask Uh, please, can you come again? I was just offline. Uh, for uh, okay, is it like the last five minutes or? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So I think the discussion was... Uh, okay. <laughs> the discussion is like there is... What's the name? So like we did two things or we did majorly one thing, custom data sets. And the other thing, maybe if you could kindly go through going modular, so it helps you on how you would arrange like your uh, code. Yes. Then I think finally, then we discuss like in terms of review, I'll be sending the reviews inshallah very soon. And then more importantly, the peer grading for week three is like peer graded. So you would be marking or you would be reviewing your colleagues uh, notebook or code and maybe give them suggestion. I also review receive a review from someone else. So it helps you to look at how someone else is working and maybe you could kind of copy their own style and maybe also advise them in a very nice way or what they could do better. So that's majorly it. Then yes, we will try to complete all the nine chapters. But yes, yeah, so we will try to complete all the nine chapters. So there will be, apart from your assignments, there are maybe two other major assignments. One is when we reach... Uh, it's an individual assignment when we reach uh, transfer learning, where you work on transfer learning projects with some data sets, which I would kind of prescribe, but you could use any data sets you want. So then you have one final uh, main assignment, so which is towards the end of the towards the end of these nine chapters. So that would be likely in group of two or three or fours in which you work on an end-to-end -end project and hopefully you deploy them but we'll just make the necessary adjustment just so that you have some good resources that will help you and it won't be much of a big problem. And yes, we'll do all the nine chapters. So I think that's uh, major it for me. So I think the likely maybe, but if there's any questions, feel free. So you could ask. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. Thank you. So uh, I think that's majorly it. Uh, thanks so much for your time. It was nice speaking to you uh, this evening. Okay, I think there's a question by Sani. Yes, please. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, no, I, I just want to ask, so the difference between this custom data set and yes. like you've shown two optional ways of doing that. So yes. like it's not very clear for me, like uh, the uh -huh. two pieces. So maybe if you can just. Okay. Okay. I think in a very, so imagine, so let's say you have, why you want to use like custom data sets in general is let's say you are, you have like some data sets and that doesn't exist in like the default, you know, there is like the vision, touch vision data sets. 
that has like fashion MNE cipher and the rest, and you want to use a different, a very different data set that is, I don't know, maybe very local, uh, some set of images that are not structured. So one way you could do it, you could do it in two ways. This is like uh, image folder. So image folder, what it does is it looks at you passing a folder and it loads the data set from the folder easily. But the issue with, so one, if you look at this folder and now, let me see, you have like data set, cool. And this is like some data set that has like photos of pizza, sushi and steak. Then you have, if you look at it, it's orderly. So what you could do is you pass in this folder to this folder part to this, uh, let me see, to one minute. Yes, you pass in this folder to image folder. So yes, you pass it to this image folder here. Then it automatically like goes through all the subdirectories and data and loads them for you automatically. So that's like one way, like your image, your image is already structured all along. But let's see in the case that in the worst case, actually you don't have this, you don't have everything arranged in test or train data. So everything is like unstructured entirely. So, and if you pass it to, if you pass it to this image folder, so it will cause problems for it and likely you will get an error. So, so to overcome that, or when you are dealing with very complex data that doesn't have structure, so what you do is use custom data sets. So with custom data sets, like you define how you want it to load your data. So let's see, assuming you have, let's see one way, you, one example, assuming you have like a text file or CSV file that has like a set of parts. Let's see. Let's say you have a CSV file with, let's say, image. Let's say you have, let's say, assuming this is, you have like a CSV file that is like comma separated of several images. So, you know, like actually, this is a CSV file, and CSV is just one file entirely that has like some data. So it's comma separated, but but you want to build a custom data set. You want to build a custom data set for it. So what you could do is in your custom data set, you define how it reads. First, it reads the CSV. Then it kind of breaks the CSV into maybe several parts and reads the file, the location of the files from that CSV. Again, in this particular point, you have like CSV coming in, which in your image folder you don't have. So here with custom data set, you define like how it will read the image from any maybe file or data structure or folder structure. So which image folder doesn't give you that option entirely. So that's, uh, that's the idea. So Kaga, let's say in this example, you have let's say a CSV file, which contains maybe this content. So, if you can't pass a CSV file into like image folder, so it would raise some errors because you're expecting like a path. So it loads from that path. So in that particular case, what you do is you use custom data sets and it loads and you define how it loads. You define like the logic in which it loads the data. So that's majorly it. So yes, yes, that's it. But happy to. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I, I understand. Uh, so oh. this, this image yes. folder is not a custom data. Can yes. You? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I believe like your is very valid. It's not a custom data set. If I think maybe in custom here they mean like data set that is outside like the vision dot data set. So okay. it is custom okay. because it is maybe a new data. So it's okay. like your own data. So I think that's how they mean by custom. But because data. what confuses me was that uh mm. I think even the uh, folder arrangement, you as the like a uh, trainer is the one that will arrange the folders in your yes. drive or folder or computer, like local drive. But now it's mm. clear. Yeah, I understand. Okay, okay, okay. That okay. Outside those uh like uh touch vision and the rest. Yes, yes, yes. I think let's say I think that's the neatest way to put like that's the idea of like the person that uh did this uh what's the name? This library. Okay. So yeah, it's clear, thank yeah. you. Uh, no problem. I think one final thing, if you are looking to contribute, 
there is one issue I saw in this repository. You could easily contribute and maybe have some maybe contributions to the repo. If you look at this the one. Ah no, when when you try to click on one minute, please. Yes, when you try to click on this. Okay, no. <laughs> one minute. Oh. Yes, so when you try to click on this, it raises an error, 404. And there is one or two particular links that have like the same issue. Let me see. Mm, I can't. Yeah, but when you you see it raises an error, but you could make the so how you could you could easily see like they change the part of this. You could see here it's like plot transform score, but when you look at it here, they've changed the actual part of it here. You could see it's like illustration of transform. It's just like transforms alone. I'm gonna like pattern has changed. So you could see like all the transform. So if you want to make the contribution to actual GitHub repo, which is which will be a very big plus to you. So you could just make the pull request and send it to them. So maybe Daniel will see and he will approve. That's if you are interested. I think apart from this link, I hope there are two or three links that you would see. Yes, this one and yes, this one and this one. You you could make the valuable contributions, inshallah, and maybe you have like some pull requests to your GitHub repo. So that's uh, that's all, guys. So just feel free if you want. So you could uh, also do that, inshallah. Mm. So thanks uh, very much. It was really nice speaking to you this weekend and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend. And uh, I don't think we would maybe meet tomorrow, but if you want to meet or discuss anything, just let me know, then we will discuss about it, inshallah. Mm. Oh, thanks. So...